So I'm going to be talking about black holes, and I would like to begin with an idealized description of how black holes are born. Uh, you'll hear a much more realistic description of this uh, from Adam Burroughs uh, later on in the, uh, this meeting. If you have a very massive star, say 30 solar masses, uh, when it exhausts the uh, nuclear fuel that it's, uh, w by which it burns that keeps it hot, then it will begin to shrink because it can no longer maintain the heat that is keeping it blown up to its large size. As it shrinks smaller by Newton's inverse square law of gravity, the gravitational pull at its surface becomes bigger. The mass is, remains the same, and so you have the size of the, uh, black, of the star, and gravity becomes four times larger. Space-based interferometers, like the LISA detector that I mentioned before, look at frequency bands between 10 to the minus 4 hertz and a tenth of a hertz, uh, and uh, are capable of seeing black holes with masses between 10,000 and 10 million solar masses. These mirror the masses that I talked about before from electromagnetic studies. The Cygnus X1 mass up here, uh, the, uh, the black hole at the center of our galaxy would be in that category. Uh, techniques uh, based on the timing of radio pulsars and a gravitational wave passing over the Earth and interacting with our clocks on Earth that are doing the timing of radio pulsars at different locations on the sky, those will see gravitational waves with wave periods between a month and 30 years. The 30 years is basically the lifetime, uh, a useful lifetime of an astrophysicist, roughly. Yeah. Those of us who are interested in the evolution of the galaxies uh, are interested in the question of whether there's a supermassive black hole in the middle of all galaxies. And that's the related question about whether the black holes created the galaxies or the galaxies created the black holes. But now, uh, and one of the ways to solve this would be to see whether we can detect black holes in the middle of all the galaxies. But if now you are telling us perhaps, and this is my question, that when galaxies merge and their supermassive black holes merge, maybe they get kicked out of the galaxies. Maybe there's enough of this momentum effect to kick them out. Is, is that right, even for supermassive black, okay. black holes? So, so we now have enough simulations let me, let me back up. So the parameter space for simulations is huge. It has seven dimensions. The ratio of the masses of the black holes is one number. The magnitude of the spin of one black hole is another number. And then there are two directions. That gets you to four. And then you've got another spin, uh, uh, which gives you seven uh, dimensions. So you have a di seven, seven different parameters that you can choose in doing black hole simulations. Uh, enough simulations have now been done in the last five years since the, this, these remarkable young people who do these simulations uh, really got going successfully that, uh, that this uh, issue has been more or less scoped down. I'm not on top of the precise numbers, but the number is something like uh, at most a few percent uh, are going to have a big enough kick to get ejected from the uh, nuclei of galaxies. Uh, almost all, like 98%, are going to get too small a kick. Uh, and, and so there's, uh, and as, as astronomers, you're not likely to pin things down uh, to, to uh, say that 98% of all galaxies as opposed to 99% uh, have black holes. And so it's, uh, uh, this is not going to get rid of the black holes at the level that one is likely to be able to, to discern astronomically in the next decade.